let's unmute myself. No, it's all right. All good. Thank you, Andrew. All right. Thanks for having me here. So, um, usually I wouldn't start with CV, but actually for this talk, it sort of matters. There's a few stages in my life which really motivated this talk. So let's just quickly go through. I mean, my background is that I did study computer science at ETH, learned Haskell, and got the buck. I was like, all right, how can I continue doing Haskell? The only option back then was to do a PhD. It was interesting otherwise as well, but Haskell was, was an argument for me. So, and I consider this actually my first commercial Haskell development because that, that's when I really wrote a large problem. What I was doing is uh, I was looking at a question of how do you verify a security protocol, something like TLS, how can you model it, model its security properties, and then reason about its correctness. So that's essentially sort of the development of specialized theorem provers. And theorem provers, one of the key algorithms is unification. That's when I first stumbled up unification. I have to say, <clears throat> made quite a few mistakes there. I mean, it's pretty easy to get something that is sort of okay. I had so much space to hide errors. I was really surprised because usually I had sort of the Haskell experience. Oh, it type checks, it works. Well, obviously you have to work carefully but careful working didn't suffice anymore for unification. Anyway, so I continued that, finished my PhD, and then was very lucky that there was some courageous band building an e-learning platform for enterprise that was better. And I started there as a Haskell engineer. The business model wasn't all sound. Engineering was very good. Can't say anything else. So uh, I then switched to IBM research. Uh, until essentially I got a very tempting offer this, with this question of, well, this is Bitcoin stuff. And here's the question of how do we automate contract execution with these ideas? I didn't know the question, but it sort of actually matched pretty well. So I started implementing actually unification again someplace. Um, and we hit up on a pretty good solution. We're lucky Digital Asset bought the Swiss startup. And ever since then, I've been a Haskell engineer and also leading the language engineering team here at Digital Asset. Um, yeah, that's why I'm actually here. That's why I have this strong connection to New York now, aside from the connection to Haskell. The other thing that I really see at Digital Asset is this is the first time for me that I see a large engineering team in action. And I see how important it is to enlist the machines to actually check our code, check consistency. So testing, you really can't, you can sort of, Play it by ear a bit when you're just two PhD students doing that unification, well, theorem prover. But right now, I mean, testing is just, yeah, it's right here. You need to do that. So that brought me to this question of, well, I would really like to see, I would like to experience whether full test-driven development works to catch the box I knew about that sort of hide in this unification algorithm. I also learned last ICFP from Jacob Stanley, the author of the Hedgehog uh, Library, that Hedgehog apparently is, is really much better than Quick Check. He convinced me, so I really want to try that out. So what I'm presenting today is the result of that experiment. Together, we're sort of gonna relive some of these experience I had when trying this out, and have some fun to experience what does it mean? What does unification theory, test-driven development, how good does it work, good and bad, and property-based testing. Just for me to check. Who has implemented unification? Oh, oh, all right, all right. I, I have to take care to not make too many mistakes. Um, who uses test-driven development in his day job? Good stuff. Proper software engineering here in New York. Why does unification matter? I actually already said it. It's, it's really, it is a key algorithm in symbolic reasoning. It's used in all theorem provers. It's used to type inference. That's an example here. Actually, down here you see the unification equation. Unification is about solving equations between terms that have variables. Substituting these terms with further terms such that two sides of the equation become equal. Here we have a case where actually whatever substitution you choose, you can't make them equal in the equation of theory that's used here. Now again, okay, I, I just made a point that forward. Unification is actually a big topic. Right here in this talk, I'm going to focus on the very simplest perspective on it. And for the experts in the room, I'm going to skip over a few things, but that's okay. All right, but we need some theory. So terms. 
simplest definition of first order terms is that we actually start with two sets. We start with a set of variables, V, and a set of constructors, C. And then we define a set of first order terms as the smallest set that's closed under these two rules. Well, every, the first rule, what does it say? Every variable is in this set of terms. And the second rule says, if you pick any constructor and any number of terms, just apply that constructor to the terms and you've got a term again. So these terms are not typed, confuses us sometimes. It's just, it's a large enough set with which you can actually talk about unification. Let me give an example. So if you look at Haskell types, then let's assume we have variables A, B, C. We have constructors int, char, fun r. So I'm using here a prefix, a prefix notation for the function arrow, maybe in pair. And we can build these example terms from it. The Haskell type int is actually the int constructor applied to no term. It's a nullary constructor. Haskell type variable A is a variable A on the term side. Maybe B of A is maybe applied to pair to B of A. Function arrows, well, we see that actually they are parenthesized to the right. So we have function arrow of A, and function arrow of B, C here. Last but not least, here we have a type which is syntactically correct, char applied to int and int. Most people would not write that because it's sort of easily excluded in our minds. It's, and it's also excluded by the GHC compiler because it says, well, this is ill-kinded. However, in our term language here, we can represent that. This is a valid term because we only, the terms essentially only define the syntactic set. They don't yet care about the subset of for example, well kind of types. All right, so much for terms, so far good? Cool, substitutions. So there's a few definitions out there. This one works pretty well. It's a, fine, it's a map from a finite set of variables to the terms with which they should be substituted. We write them in this form. So x1 maps to t1, blah, 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 xk maps to dk. Applying a substitution to term is done by going through the term and substituting each variable with the corresponding term. If there's no mapping for that variable in the map, well, then it's just left as is. So here are a few examples. If you apply the substitution B maps to A to int, we get int, there's no variable in here. If we apply B maps to int to the pair of A and B, we get a pair of a int. Note that actually here I'm using a notation liberty. I'm not writing this nullary constructor anymore because that's just confusing. Here's a bit of wider example. We have two variables occurring here, but the substitution talks only about one of them. It maps b to a and c to d. <coughs> and yeah, unsurprisingly, b is replaced with a. That shouldn't be anything surprising. I'm just talking about, that, about it such we all have the same context when we go into the code. Unification problem, we can finally specify it. In its simplified form, what it is about is if you're given two terms, T1 and T2, find a substitution that when applied to both terms yields the same term. Let's look at a few example, examples. So I'm like in GHC, I'm using tilde as an equation constraint. So I want to have a equal to int. We can solve this unification equation by the substitution a mapping to int. Int equal maybe a is unsolvable. There's no substitution that makes them equal. There's always going to be the int constructor out there and the maybe constructor that just clashes. Here's the other example. That's what's usually called the occurs check. There's no substitution that you can apply on both sides. Well, actually, I actually have to tell it the other way around. If you want to solve this equation, whatever value you choose for A, the other side is gonna be one larger, sort of. It just has a maybe around it and you can't get rid of it. Um, that here is about the same case. It's two different constructors. This one's interesting. This equation is not solvable because the two constructors are not applied to the same numbers of terms. So essentially the arity is not the same here in these applications. For the next one, 
we get a solvable equation again, and we can sort of start to think about how would we approach this problem of finding a solution. We can approach it very similarly to how you are used to using this, Eulerian. Ah, anyways, let's not use terms, but how you're used to solve linear algebra equations. You take the first equation, you get from there a substitution from one variable, substitute it, and then continue this way. So here what we do is we put the two terms side by side. We say, oh, pair and pair equal. Okay, let's take the arguments from that, build equations between them, and continue solving. So if we solve left to right, then we will see, all right, A maps to A. Yep, trivially solved for every substitution. B maps to int. All right, let's give that substitution back. I have here another example where, also, where, where this is also a solution to this simplified unification problem. The unification algorithm for the simplified problem could decide to just say, oh, if I see a variable, let's make it an int, just because I can. And I might actually even produce a solution. The notion which distinguishes between these two solutions, the one which is sort of the most general and one which is more specialized, is the notion of a most general unifier. I actually have it down here, and that is actually the proper definition of the unification problem. First order unification problem is that if you have two terms, T1 and T2, you want the substitution sigma such that the terms are equal. And for every other substitution, which is also a unifier, this other substitution can be shown to be just a specialization of sigma. So if you take sigma and compose it with another substitution tau, you get that more specialized row that would be an alternative. This is about as much as I want to tell about unification theory. I have here the link for a nice chapter in the Handbook of Symbolic Reasoning, which tells you a lot about unification. It's a cool topic, but it's not the topic of today, sort of in depth. Just to so, show one other case, sort of, which can happen when solving, um, I wanted to look at this example. So here, if you go left to right, we see, all right, A needs to be equal to B. And then we continue and we see, oh, but b needs to be equal to int, which means that we not only need to remember now that b maps to int, but we also need to update this first solution which we've chosen. These, I'm showing you these cases such that we can remember them when we go through the algorithm to say, oh yeah, that, that's here where the update happens. Or perhaps we see we forget it. It's a common mistake. Um, yeah, so far, probably ready. Good. Test-driven development, yeah, everybody held his hand up, so I'm gonna be really cheap here. What I really like to reiterate is this golden rule of test-driven development, never write production code without a failing test. What I really like about this is that this gives us a systematic process for writing testable code that is tested. And I really like systematic processes. Type, strongly typed code is another such systematic process. For me, this is just going one step further on that, it makes total sense. Nevertheless, testing is not a silver bullet. I mean, the real world is always wins and reality is a bitch. Uh, but here for testing, one of the important caveats to always keep in mind is that specifications are almost always incomplete. What does that mean? So there's this actually very nice paper which um, did an experiment of auto-generating repairs based on bugs that are identified by test suit. So they had a test suit, this defects for j data set. They had an algorithm which generated patches to the code. And then they checked that out of the 224 failing tests, their algorithm could generate 47 patches that passed the <laughs> test suit. But upon manual inspection, only nine of them were actually correct. So that means there are 36 changes to the code base, which make the test perfectly pass, but are bogus. Um, yeah, that's sort of keeping in the back of our minds. All right, last but not least, property-based testing, and then we get to coding. What's the idea there? There's a really nice idea in property-based testing. Um, I'm gonna demonstrate it on the example of, unif uh, of unification. So, unify, and here I'm really referring to the simplified definition. Takes two terms, returns you either nothing for unsolvable or just a substitution. 
the property which we want to have really is that for any two terms, if there exists a unifier, then unify must return one. And the idea now by property, behind property-based testing is that for quite a few properties holds that they have many smallish counterexamples. You, you really need both. That's the assumption you're making. Why do you need many? Well, we want to replace universal quantifiers like these bodies out here with random sampling. Now, random sampling, if you draw 100 samples from a space that is 2 to the power of 64, it's a little dust speck. This only works if most of, most of the random samples you draw in that space are counterexamples. You actually have a decent chance of hitting counterexamples. But they also need to be smallish because usually sort of these random sampling algorithms, they don't just generate uniformly something in the space of 2 to the power of 64 or whatever space you're looking at. They generate sort of the smaller cases first. They're biased towards smaller cases. But nevertheless, the idea is nice. Instead of doing manual replacement of the universal quantifiers with samples, we actually use a random sampling. So therefore, we have a different kind of bias. And for existential quantifiers, you're still back to actually writing code that takes the context and computes a witness for the existential quantifier and checks whether it's satisfied. So yeah, I already mentioned that. Um, the caveats really in property-based testing, it's, it's really not a silver bullet. Um, it always has sample bias if you use it in practice. Not all properties have these smallish country examples. It can also be that the corner cases, so the last few blocks, can be really hard to sample. And exponentially large spaces are really large. Just because you couldn't easily generate a thousand samples, you shouldn't feel that a thousand samples are many or enough. So when actually in the first run, I didn't have this conclusion and I really had to find out you can't replace unit tests with property-based testing. It's so easy to miss, miss cases. We should actually see some of this later on. Good. With that said, what I now want to do is, um, so I have here the full instructions to set up a new project. I've already done, what I did, I've done the install of GHCID. Who knows GHCID? That tool is the best tool for Haskell development right now. It's really crude, but it works. Uh, you're going to see it in action. It's very easy to use. Um, I'm going to remove the executable stanza, talk about that, and then I will want to do three things. I want to have a REPL for me to try out things manually. I want to have an automatic test loop, so I'm going to use GCID to just auto-reload and file change and run the tests. And I want to have automatic computation of the test coverage with HPC. All right. Let's see whether I'm not hit by the demo effect. Um, stack new TT unif font size, OK? I will put them online, yes, yes. Uh, I'll post a comment on the meetup. Cool. Definitely, that's what I was just asking. Tell me when it's enough. So for the ones very much in the back, still up? All right, I hope uh, I still can fit 80 characters in there. Well, that's okay. Um, cool. All right, the first thing I need to do is um, I want to remove this executable stanza. We just want to develop a library, and actually, we really just want to have this easy test loop. Next thing is um, font size. Tell me when it's good enough. It looks like that looks like the same. Um, right, stack. So, GHCID, what it does, it takes a command that points, you, points it to a GHCI session. So here I'm going to use a stack REPL 
the test argument to also load my test suit. And then you can give it a command that it should run on every successful load of all modules in the GTI um, console. I'm going to use column main. Um, first time we compile. All right, test suit not implemented. Let's get this a bit further. So what we have here is library file, a spec. Ah, here's the test suit not implemented. So import our library. Let's be a bit cheap. I'm actually going to write the run tests function right besides the code that I'm talking about. The reason for this is really convenient such that you guys don't always see me switching files. All right, so I was promising there's a run test function in here. Uh, yeah, not being from here, I think I can write it. Yeah, all right, auto reload worked. Cool. The other thing we want to have is stack test coverage. I'll watch. Stack really makes Haskell development quite nice. I'm not religious about it. Cabal new build is also pretty nice, but honestly, I just want the tools to work. So what I get here is that I have an auto rebuild of the coverage report for my library module. Again, not the font size. It's good. Okay. So we can use that to inform ourselves what's tested, what's not. Um, good. We were talking about unification. We obviously need some types. Almost there. We want to talk about terms, substitution, and unification. And we have another section in our module where we talk about testing. All right. Need some variable identifiers. Let's use string for that. Construction identifiers, uh, terms. That's looking good. Compiling, fine, all right. Uh, we want to talk about unify. Term, term, maybe subst, and still good. And to talk about a property of unify, I was referring to apply. So let's also add this function to take a subst Oh, why is this? I haven't stored my file yet. Right. Let's take a step back, look at the error. So right, subs is not known. Um, my suggestion here for subs would be that we say, this is just map strict map from bar ID to term. This means Yes. Yep, that's a common error. Um, if you have auto reload in GHC, uh, well, if you have GHC ID, the session you have um, runs in a fixed package context. Here I need another package exposed. So it's a, the containers package. So I will have to add here as the dependencies containers. And I'm also going to take one step ahead and Close Hedgehog. I need to restart this session, whereas on this one actually it works automatically because the entry path is through Stack itself, who essentially sees the full context, always rereads the package file. Um, good. Cool. Still there. So, how should we start testing? 
Who wants to push an idea? What? what? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're going to go for unit tests first. We had these few examples, and you just suggested one. Sounds good. I did write last, so I actually did that talk already one run. That time I wrote everything out, but I got the feedback. It's a tad boring, and it's really tight. So this time I'm actually going to use that past experience as a blueprint. Um, because there's a bit of boilerplate to write, so... Let me just copy that whole test execution. Okay. Um, and also a bit of context, sorry. It's not gonna take too long. Right, it's telling me that I haven't yet defined apply. So that is subst term to term. And I'm going to go through the test suite with you guys afterwards. So I just want to get it all compiling. So now we're in a state where I'm explaining what actually works. All right. So run tests has a bunch of tests for apply. I mean, it doesn't make sense if you use apply to test unify. We need to make sure that the apply behaves as expected. Otherwise, there could be a, a mistake in apply hiding a mistake in unify. Bless you, sir. Um, there's going to be a bunch of unit tests on uh, unify. Let me remove that. And here, actually, I'm using some hedgehog tools uh, to discover all properties in the file and run them. So what do we have in there? For the unit test specification, the first thing I do is I actually build myself a few smart constructors. So I have VAT for a variable A term, BT int term, just for the int. Maybe T is actually constructed, takes a term and builds a term that sort of wraps it as a maybe pair. And I have a make subs, which just takes a substitution from, or list from top of variables to terms to subs. Um, they're not as nicely readable, but still, I dare say, reasonably readable. So what do we have here for apply? We say, well, if you take the int and apply make subs, so apply the substitution from B to variable of A, you get an int back. Um, pair. And actually, these cases, I made them such that they are exactly the ones which we just discussed here and here. Um, so for unify, it's a bit larger, but matches as well. Again, the reason was I, I didn't want to go with you through all of these details. We've already done that. So just believe me, we have these test cases ready. What we want to see afterwards is sort of which, how well do these test cases guide us in the implementation of apply and unify. Um, and please feel free to just interrupt, ask questions if not something not clear. Yeah? Does variable capture become a problem with the implications of your first Like, so there's just no variable capture. Because I had like this like, predetermined uh, function from A to B. Like, it's, there, there's nothing with the first function. If we did, then we would have a problem. Okay. Um, let, let me see whether I understood your question correctly. So, you're talking about variable capture in the form of if you have, for example, a, a constructor for a lambda function, so for a lambda, then that, um, that would be a bound variable and you shouldn't substitute it. Right. Is that what you were talking about? So I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering like, this, if you had the function from, from A to B, right? one R A B and then one C D, like those, those should be, so I'm just wondering if there's if uh, there's uh, an equivalent uh, wrinkle in this model that arises like in some of the So in these types, so in this in a type like this, all of the variables are free, so none of them is captured or or bound. So um, let let's see that we have. 
So here, if you have lambda x to x y, in this expression, the variable x is bound here, whereas the variable y is free. If you were to apply a substitution mapping x to one, then the result of this would still be the very same term because there's no free x in there. So here you have to take care of variable culture. Um, it's actually, I mean, this is, you have to take care of bound variables. Variable capture is actually a different phenomenon. It's the phenomenon that if you have, oh, let's see what I can construct it in real time. So we want to have x, y, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, here we have it. So we have the application of this function and x. Here, I need to see exactly right. If you have this function application, this is still, this is an expression in the lambda calculus. So if we reduce this function application, we take this C and use it to substitute uh, here for X and let me put it in here. So if you do that naively, then we say, well, this is C maps to C. But that's wrong. We actually have to rename this variable and it's gonna be the second one. And the first one is actually the free variable C. Experts, please check this was all real time, is right? Uh, X is out there and it's, sub it's the first one. So the C from outside lands in the first position. Oh. Cool. All right. So, right, back to our simpler terms which have only three variables, nothing, nothing bound. Yeah, bound variables are the other case which really fucks you up when writing uh, symbolic reasoning code. Cool, so we're at that point where we have a ton of tests failing. That's good. We can now write production code. So let's make this a bit less daunting. Let's first actually just take the first of our applied test case and solve that one. And one thing that is really nice, I was really surprised at the quality of Hedgehog's error report. So what you see here is Hedgehog actually does enough reflection so that it can pretty print the code that is failing. So it says unit test apply in line 99, here fails. And it says, right, when you tell me annotate show TC for test case, this is your test case here. <coughs> Let me make this a bit wider. So it's a test case where we have int substitute with B maps to A and should be int. And it says, well, this equality check actually does not succeed, it has an exception. An exception is that undefined is called, where from? Actually from lib 29, right? It's pretty much telling us where we should work. Yeah. So, does anybody see sort of a really cheap implementation for undefined? Const entity? ID. ID. Yeah, okay. Cool. Pass the test. So much for test case uh, <laughs> specification completeness. Well done. Did you spot it? Yeah. I mean, did you, did, you spot it? did you immediately see that this will make it pass? Awesome. Let's see whether you can come up with good solutions for the next one. All right. Pair A, B, substitute app int. I think we are out of luck with cheating. So yeah, it actually shows one example that when writing your test cases, you really still need to understand your problem domain. You need to make sure sort of, okay, what are all the cases that should occur? You want to write these tests because you can write them sort of flat out without being concerned about implementation mistakes. I mean, see, it's a good form of redundancy. Not too many, but not too few. Okay, ST, let's just have the fun.
find with default. If you don't find a variable, we just get t back, and otherwise we get this. App C T S um, app C map y s t s. I mean, usually I have to admit, back then my PhD self would have just written this apply function carefully, like a line like this. Yeah, this makes sense, nicely structured. And um, yeah, I think this one is correct, but let's make sure that we have all tests enabled. Uh, cool. um, does anybody see an option to do property-based testing on this? Is, is there a property which we can write down which sort of tells us whether apply is working correctly? Uh, yeah, okay, so let me see what I can write that. So what you're saying is for all terms t, prop apply identity. Um, all t apply. Should we just take the empty subst? Yeah, let's, let's do that. <laughs> apply empty subst t equals t. Oh, all right. Now, what do we have in Hedgehog? Um, Hedgehog gives us a function for all that takes a generator, um, and I have one specified down there, so let's for now just assume it's a term generator. To so say, oh yeah, take a for all quantifier and use this generator to sample from the space that it should actually quantify over. Here we have a T, and then we have this triple equals, which says assert that these two things are equal. Empty subs, uh, let's define that. Subs. Okay. Uh, any two substitutions, if you apply one and the next, I'll be the same as unioning them together and applying. No, that's not true. Um, Actually, don't spoil it. Let's just do it. <laughs> yeah, we need compose anyways. Not really for apply. I mean, the law really is there for if you have compos function composition, then you can talk about associativity. So, um, so that's a good one. Let's see, before we go there, let, let's see what actually our property here holds. Um, yep, so this property up here holds. So that's good. Um, let's move that down here. And just as backup, I was beforehand, I was using this term G. So, sorry guys. Um, yeah, so what, what, we sh what we see here is that actually you need a special combinator from Hedgehog to generate recursive elements of a recursive type. The reason for that is if you're naive about deciding when to recurse, and you never then and there's always a non-zero probability for recursion well then you can end up with really deep terms so what Hedgehog does it actually not only track it, it tracks sort of the target size <clears throat> and it always halves that size in this combinator and going for a recursive term um, but otherwise this is pretty straightforward so here we have a generator for random variables we actually make a small world assumption here we say all the counter examples for our properties, they're going to be, they can be written with just the variables A and B. 
that again is, is actually an important choice because if you were to make that small world assumption and would have a large number of variables, it might well be that the problems where two variables need to be the same are very unlikely to hit. So here we, we already custom designing our sampling strategy. I would actually resonate you with my top lines as three because I know that there are some like two variable fragments of logic that have interesting. That is a very good argument. Yeah, yeah. Um, I hope I used it consistently. Uh, down here we have a body where we need to have the TC. So yeah, actually that brings us to a point where we can look at the random generator so at, at the question of, well, how do we property test unification? How, how do we actually tackle that property? So let me finish this part. So we need A, B. Yeah, so having seen this very simple property, which essentially tells us what Tetra gives us is you have a monadic fragment where you say, oh, for all this value, uh, so you can use for all quantifiers, you can use assertions in between, and that's how you build your property. We see that this property which we have here, this one, doesn't really fall in that fragment. The problem here is these existential quantifiers, they're not that easy to resolve. But luckily, we brought our logic tools. I see there's a few in the audience that have them. So if you've done theorem proving, so in the interactive theorem proof like Cock or Isabel Hall, the first thing you do when actually going for a proof for such a property is, okay, get rid of the all quantifiers and convert equivalency into two implications. So that's what I've done here, added the for all quantifiers again. So I have it in one direction, if there exists unifier, unifier must find it. In the other direction is, well, if Unify finds a unifier, then there must exist one. But this is a trivial case, but the important one is if Unify doesn't find one, so if this one is false, then this one must be false as well. It's actually correct. I'll leave that for checking with you. Um, what we can definitely do with this form is then we can actually move out this existential into a universal and actually say, well, one of the key properties is that if we draw two terms and a substitution, which by luck um, or where by, by luck the substitution is a unifier, um, then the unifier must return a substitution that is a unifier. They don't have to be the same. So there's a tiny weeny ampersand upper tick hidden here, um, but there must exist one substitution. And the other direction would actually be that we say, well, if unify returns nothing, we need to prove that for all substitutions, um, they don't unify the two terms. This body here is again, is one actually which sort of falls out of this property testable fragment. Because it's not that, I mean, with random sampling, you can't prove that something's not true. But yeah, let's, let's focus on this body. We have this property, and here we see one of the nice parts. We could actually first use logic to sort of divvy up the properties, and now we can pretty literally translate that. For all T1, T2, sigma, okay, for all T1, T2, sigma, S, use the term generators, use substitution generator, check that the precondition holds. So this discard here is a function provided by Hedgehog that just allows you to say, oh no, this is not a valid test case. And otherwise, call unify. If it returns nothing, it's a failure. If it returns substitution, check that this right-hand side holds as well. And if that doesn't hold, it's a failure. So that, that is really powerful. The question then is, we already described how we can uh, describe, uh, generate terms. Substitutions is already a bit more difficult. Here, what I'm doing is I said, well, small world assumption, generate three terms and then make it such that I filter all the cases where a variable is mapped to itself. So this means I really generate empty substitution, a one element substitution, and so on. 
Um, yeah, so let's see whether this actually, sorry, gives us good information. So in a state where these are the applied tests, this is the unifiable unifies property, which we've just looked at. And it's telling us that there's an undefined in there. Good. That's not surprising. But let's actually, let's actually make this a bit more clever, this property. And let us, such that it tells us what was the test case. I'm sorry, now I'm a bit surprised. Uh, let me look at, so what I was expecting is that annotate show would sort of annotate it in case of a failure. Pardon? No, the only find that it hits is the one in 40, um, which is likely our unification algorithm. Well, actually I just used the Oracle. Audience, what do we do with this unify? What do we return? Deeply. I like that. <laughs> uh, file watching is a bit slow here. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, come on, screw you. That doesn't unify. Um, right, and actually, if you look at this counter example, it's really nice. For every for all, it annotates what value was drawn. I, I'm still impressed by that. Actually, I haven't looked how it's done. All right. We have a test case. Two times the same variable, some substitution. Um, pessimist unification algorithm, flawed. How do we do better? <laughs> the optimistic one. All right. Perhaps you can have another sample. I think that one doesn't work as well. So, yeah, we see that property based testing here doesn't allow us to cheat our way through. Um, one thing which you can do to actually sort of have a bit of focus, we can copy this recheck. Um, and where do we have our run tests? It's up here. Everything goes well? Right. We have exactly that example. So we have an app of int of app of int and a variable c. And we see that if we substitute c with app of int, obviously that unifies. So yeah, um, let me check the time to see whether we can do audience space coding. Ah, yeah, you can give it a, a few, few shots. So how should we implement unification? Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, um, singleton subs B two T one. Right. Let's see whether that is really a viable strategy to implement unification. <laughs> um, sorry, I, I lost a bit my way around here. Right, recheck. We leave it in. We just want to make sure that we don't hit that problem again. Properties, tell us. Okay. This time we have two equal terms. 
Let me copy that as well. What do we do about them? Yeah, okay, that one we killed, but now we have another problem. Oh, it's the other way around. It's var. All right. So. I, I understand, but I'm, I, I feel like not all restructuring right now. No, no, it's, it's totally okay. Um, this case, we can just solve by doing the other case distinction, this direction. Okay, we want T2. Nothing. Oh. Yeah, we could have just swapped. We have another failure. This is not a good strategy. <laughs> it's, yeah, this is one of the algorithms where really you have to step back, think about how do I recurse here? What state do I need to track? And how do I solve that? You already had a hint at that, but I really, I, I really like that. I also, first run I did it, second run I did it. I just like seeing that, yes, you can't just blindly solve all of these problems. Yeah, that usually works well, if you don't need a recursive argument why, or an inductive argument why your algorithm is correct. Now, <clears throat> the other thing I wanted to do, so here what I now want to do is actually switch tack, implement unification correctly, but have both the unit tests and the property-based tests sort of as, as guidance to see when actually property-based tests are gonna fail and, and when not. Um, so I'm gonna enable all these tests on our failures, that's totally okay, because now we're actually just gonna think of it. So, we mentioned before, and it's like solving equations. Trick really is, and, and we were saying like, yeah, all right, you have your solution, you come into your equation, and then you look at how do you have to extend that solution to solve all this equation. So equations actually look really simple. What you want is, we, we, we just dissolve, generalize the unified problem. It says, under the given substitution, are all of these equations solvable with an extension of that substitution? If it exists, then give back that extension. If not, then return nothing. Um, I'm just gonna drop that. And the first thing we can do when we actually make sort of this argument for, okay, let's generalize our induction hypothesis in a certain sense. Then uh, we just check whether we can actually solve the problem which we started with. And all right, solve empty subs of T1 equals T2. That's exactly what we want to do. Ah, we're not going to undefined here. All right. So here we can now start this other approach, um, sort of the purely functional approach to solving such a problem, coming up with an algorithm. We look at the structure over which we induct and argue case by case why we're doing the right thing there. So the simplest case is we don't have an equation and really there is only one solution. But that's sort of right. We could return nothing, but we're not gonna play these silly games anymore. All right, next case is that we actually have an equation, T1, T2. And we have some further equations. And we're gonna follow your lead and say, yeah, let's case this thing. So if you're in the case that we have a variable v1 and a the other side, well, let's we, we can sort of solve it. How do we solve it? Hmm, let's see. 
I mean, we sort of need to extend the substitution so we can perhaps just insert the mapping. Uh, so, yeah, if it's already there, something's weird. So this, this is good. This is, this is sort of the thinking that you should have in writing such an algorithm. So, um, let me first finish what I wanted to write. So here we really want to sort of continue solving with an extended solution, the rest of the equations. But this extension somehow, you already found a country example. You said, well, if that variable is already substituted, we should solve the equation after the substitution. So let's do that a bit better. So for this, what you actually will just do is take EQ here. Oh. No, I don't want to play tricks. Um, this is T1, T2, and we have T1 prime, apply S T1. Okay, definitely. Before solving that equation, we need to make sure that we actually solve it with the most up-to-date information. Good. Let's make sure that we do all the primes here. Um, I'm actually going to disable these, take only the first of the unit cases here. Right. Because what we want to see is that we have a unit test that drives this, and the property-based test um, still finds it. In both cases, we actually hit the non-exhaustive patterns. Um, let's also enable wall so we don't have silly mistakes. Okay, we might be needing that later. Pardon? Uh, the reason why I want the warnings is because that is the standard mode how you should write code. And now we, we actually... We, we know where it happened. Now, you can just tell, it to, tell, tell us about the incomplete path. Don't tell us about the incomplete path. Yeah, true. Um, yeah. It's okay if I skip it. <laughs> um, Sorry, so we had solve, we have a pattern match that will not exhaust if that's the point which we want to have. Um, we obviously have the other side. All right. So in this case, let's just try that it can return nothing. Yeah, I concur. It's going to be too hard. OK. Unifiable unifies. It still finds a counter example. Um, it's, it's the case, actually, yeah, half a constructor equals a constructor. So we can't do the cheap nothing. That's good. Um, I mean, here, this is unlikely that we would make that mistake. So, but let's do it properly. Uh, what do we need to do? We need to guard that the two constructors are equal. We need to guard that the arity is the same. Um, and once we've done that, we can actually just recurse because we can continue solving um, the equations plus plus sip the new equations of the terms. And here, if one knows sort of how SIP behaves, that actually truncates the lists, one really sort of can infer that we need to do that check first, because otherwise it would be forgetting about some equations. Ooh, that's interesting. Let, let's see whether it actually catches this. Okay, so it, Found a case. Right. Um, that's a bit surprising. Ah, it found a case there. The equations it's solving, because one side got forgotten. 
Uh, let, let, let's see what really happens, because I'm actually confused why it finds it. Tell us, the, is that inner baby there? Look, the, 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 the inner baby, and the top one is applied to two arguments. <laughs> sorry, sorry, even further in. Yeah, well, no, they actually, they all apply to the same arguments. <laughs> actually, you know what? The mistake is not because of that. It, it actually captures a different problem in the unification algorithm. These two inserts, they're quite bogus. Um, yeah, let's remember that one and see when, once we solve the other problems that we catch this. Mm. So this here is an example of sampling bias. Everything passes, it was driving us well. Algorithm looks right. This, this would be a solution I would expect from a computer science um, master student. This is a common mistake that you sort of think like, oh yeah, I've substituted everything. I could just extend by inserting the new variable. What you're not thinking of actually that this variable might already occur in the substitution. This case where we were discussing like, oh yeah, right. First I remember B is equal to A, and then later I know that B needs to be equal to int. Now A needs to be equal to int. And these cases, they're much more convenient to actually find via unit tests. You say like, here it must work, here it must work, here it must work. Similarly like for if you're dealing with ints, you just want to test zero, one, minus zero, and the two bounds up and down. Um, so, <coughs> We only had one unit test case. Let's, let's actually get to go for all of them. Ooh, yes. There's still a few problems. Perhaps we kind of have a bit of focus. Cool. Unit test unifies. Um, the test case is we have a variable A maps to app of maybe variable fay. Oh, that's the occurs check. How are we solving that? Hmm. We just return that, um, right, yeah, this should be a map to variable fay. It's a substitution, but it won't solve the equation. So, actually here the case is, here this step, both of these steps are really elimination steps. We say, all right, we know what this variable needs to be equal to. Let's see that we can eliminate this variable and incorporate it in substitution. Let's call this elim. And here we want to eliminate v1 with t2. And this here is eliminating v2 with t1. How do we eliminate v with t? Well, we check that we, whether v is in the member of the vars, let's call them the freeze, the free variables of t. If that's the case, it's not solvable. Because we actually just found, we substitute everything and we found that, right, for every substitution, it would mean that you need some variable a to be contained, to be equal to some wrapper around it. Free vars, we have to write, um, shouldn't take too long. Confuse. Um, and we have a pattern match failure right here. Otherwise, what do we need to do? Um, well, actually for that case, the only thing we, it, we would still be fine. So we solve with ms insert v t s the remaining equalities. Hmm. Pardon? 
Yeah. So the, the counterexample here is that uh, if the variable is equal, then we should still be able to eliminate that. So let's do this. If more v equals t, then we just continue solving without a change to substitution. All right, good. Let's continue with our unit tests. Run tests. Sorry. Okay, number five, exponential search. All right, here's not a problem. So what's the problem here? You have the equation where we have pair of AA equals to pair of B int. So we find that A needs to be equal to B. Then afterwards you find another equation, A needs to be equal to int. That's actually the case where we seem to be overriding an equation. What are we doing wrong? Audience? Uh, one thing, actually, um, it seems like I'm up on the top of solve thing. Pardon? Up on the top in our solve thing, we're um, actually applying the, applying the substitution possibly more than once. That is fine if the substitution is kept idempotent during solving. Yes, well, that means that we have to do. Um, yeah, so we can go through and actually ask ourselves are we doing that? So. Um, what it important means is that the variables in the domain of the um, substitution must not occur in its range, in the free variables of the terms in its range. Um, and the only place where we extend the substitution is actually here. And we definitely guarantee that this mapping itself is it important. That's this check. Uh, what might be the case is that, let's see, could it be that another of the variables in the domain of the existing substitution occurs in this T. Yes. That is not possible as well because we first apply this substitution. It was already at impotent. All variables that occur in this range and are in T, this, this T down here is one of the T1s and T2. Both of them have been substituted, so there we find. What could though happen is that this V still occurs, already occurs in the T, in, in the terms of the substitution. So what we actually need to do is we can only insert that once we have um, mapped apply it's really, it's really annoying. Uh, this singleton substitution. So apply single singleton singleton subs to be t to s. No, I mean in in these terms there v could already occur, so we also need to apply that there. Um, let's remove that where. Probably have a parenthesis there, um, and let's see that I can write this a bit better. So um, S prime is this body here. And obviously we want S prime here. All right, solved at least that test case. We have more. Hmm. 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 
we might be lucky. So there's, we've now gone through almost all mistakes that sort of one typically makes when implementing a substitution. One of the mix, mistakes that's missing is the one where actually um, you insert from the wrong side. <clears throat> uh, and this probably looks all right. So what we can do is actually, we can give ourselves, let me check the time. Hmm. We actually switch to the blueprint. So what we can do is instead of sort of doing this manual insertion and substitution, step one, one step out and build the new substitution by composing. So use an operation which where you can say, which is sort of well behaved, well composed must be associative so we can test it independently. And then we want to say, well, I have the substitution up to here. I always want to apply that first because that solves everything before and is applied to my equation. So I want to compose my new singleton substitution to it. And that's how we implement, uh, sorry, it's blueprint. Where do we have the one from Zurich? So, unification is done here, right? And that's how we implement it here. So we solve with this compose one and compose one. We have actually a property that relates it to compose. It says, well, this should be the same as composing the simulton substitution in front of the other substitution of a property for compose itself. And that's, yeah, that, that's about it. I actually found another, when, when switching to compose, when preparing for this talk, I found another mistake in implementation I did for Zurich. It's a really tricky algorithm to get right. So, yeah, I would be interested. I mean, this, this is sort of the, the life coding part that, that I prepared. I had a bunch of conclusions from that, but I would be interested in the conclusions that you guys offer up from sort of this experience. What, what are your takeaways? Better types. Yeah. What kind of types would you use? Um, I'm, I'm not sure, but I, I feel like it has, to, it has to be a way that we can probably use the right types of that's at least part of it. So that, because it feels like at the moment, like types are quite straightforward, right? You usually have like a map of string that you like to a string. So, um, so I actually like to describe these cases where sort of really. So to me, these are cases where the types totally fail you. Um, if you want to have precise types for this, you need to go to dependent type language because actually the invariants are pretty complicated. Um, I agree with that. I would formulate a bit more generally. Types are only one option to do, so dependently typed languages are only one option to do proofs about your programs. So I would say this is a conclusion like, well, if it's really critical, like you're in an adversarial setting, human lives are at stake, you should consider proofs, be it dependent type language, be it Isabel Hall. Um, I would say that one that one type is very important to apply is to, um, to actually parameterize um, terms over a set of variables and treat variables in the, in the solved um, of the substitution as, as being from a different set as a different set from variables in the original problem. Which error would, which mistake would we have avoided with that? Uh, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't avoid a lot of them actually. The, the curves one would have not been expressed. Because, like, we turn out the, 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 the additional substitution we have to do. We didn't, we can, like, re substitute inside the, uh, the substitution. Like, those would have, like, already been solved. So we could, like, have the sort of mix. But I'm not so sure. Because, so, but then you also need, you need the mapping back because for the term equations which you generate freshly, they would have already been, the variables in there are tagged with solved. So, do you do you untag it there? Um, 
I think you would have you would end up tagging it with people more soft. <laughs> but that doesn't work because I mean all the tagging you do, uh, wait, if the type checker should deal with it, it's it's static in, in nesting depth. Well, the but, the yeah. I, I actually I mean would be a very interesting try. Um, Anything else? All right, so yeah, what did you have? I believe actually TDD works for testable code that's tested. So for this one now, the next round for me will be actually, I go through these unit tests and really think hard about, okay, do I have all sort of value flows, all, all orders in which um, these variables can go? Uh, sort of, yeah. Um, it's definitely no replacement for understanding the problem domain. You, you can't cheat on that, and if you just go blindly for the solution, you're actually not gonna hit it here. We saw sampling base in action. It first worked perfectly in property-based testing, but once you went to the corner cases, didn't work anymore. There is room for errors in incomplete specifications. And the nice thing is actually mentioning proofs on this. So this is the Isabel Hall theory, which implements terms, substitutions, and somewhere we have a most general unifier, including the proofs that actually this MGU function computes a most general unifier. It's not even too large. I mean, it's, it's more work, but also it does actually more than what we just, well, actually we implement an M MGU algorithm. The real benefit you get from this is, well, on one, you're really much more sure that's correct. Two, you gain a deep understanding of the problem domain and you can see optimizations, triad optimizations that otherwise sort of would have been hidden. Pardon? Uh, this is the ESR language for Isabel Hall. Well, actually for Isabel, right here in the whole image. Oh yeah, unification algorithms are a bitch. Now, the last part is, well, you I'm working here at Digital Asset. These kind of algorithms, some of them we use. Uh, so we have two jobs, which I believe actually are interesting for this audience. One job is in my colleagues team, it's tool and infrastructure engineer. We do build our infrastructure as code. So he's, he's maintaining all our CI testing infrastructure. Um, tooling is written in Python or Haskell. Uh, if you're interested in the build tooling, block basil, the polyglot builds, in particular basil is, is a really cool tool. Uh, we use Nix to provision all build, all tools for all developers, both on Mac OS X and Linux. Um, Haskell stack is in a few places in use, test coverage actually, uh, Yarn and this Jenkins and the Nix Hydra tooling being used. And we work on AWS GCP using Kubernetes and Docker. That, that's one role which I can recommend. Um, Clep's a really cool guy, and the uh, combination of Nix and Haskell makes it very nice. Uh, this one is actually quite global. New York City, London, Budapest, and Zurich. <coughs> Language engineering, that's the team I lead. We have 10 people um, in New York City. Shane is working with me. Uh, <coughs> feel free to hit him up afterwards. Uh, in Zurich, we have a bunch of people, and then in Sydney. We built the uh, DAML, the surface language. We built the compiler, we built the IDE. It's built on Visual Studio Code with a Haskell server in the back end. Um, we collaborate with the team building the runtime system. I mean, if you're interested in this language engineering role, the runtime system team has also open spaces. They do their work in Scala. The division is the one that um, whatever is operating in a customer's data center, runs on the JVM, so they can use the standard monitoring approaches for JVM processes. Mm -hmm. We don't want to fight that fight of, ooh, Haskell's, Haskell's too new there. Um, and then obviously a good amount of tools that we build is on testing and analysis. So when you write your DAML code, then you also want to be able to ask, answer the question of like, oh, what's the call graph um, in this form? How does authorization information flow? Yeah, so for us, it's mostly Haskell some TypeScript for VS Code, and then Scala whenever you go towards the runtime system. I'm more than happy to tell you more about these roles uh, after the meetup. You can also just write to me, actually it's very simple, Simon at Digital Asset. 
or send emailing queries to our HR representative. Perhaps she's even here, Grace. Oh, and I've always been a lucky guess. Yeah, so Grace is managing for us. Um, yeah, that's it from my side. Any questions from yours? Cool, thanks. So, uh, we, uh, we don't know what to do with it if we don't eat it. So, 